Hi there, and welcome back to the Energy Sector Heroes podcast. My name is Michelle Fraser, and every week I will speak with incredible people who share their lessons, experiences, and stories from their time spent in the energy sector. Hi there, and welcome back again to this week's episode. If you're new to the show, then please take a second to subscribe and even consider sharing the show with just one other person. This week, I am joined by Adi Akinteo. Adi is an incredible engineer manager and head of technical services. Adi, would you like to introduce yourself, please? All right. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, thanks for having me on your podcast today. My name is Adi Akintayo. I am the head of technical services for onshore major projects at Qatar Energy. I have uh, 25 years experience in the industry at the moment. I've worked for several global 500 companies across the industry, including ExxonMobil, Total, KBR, and I'm currently in the services of Qatar Energy. I've also had the privilege of working both onshore and offshore and across uh, the careers taking me across uh, several places across the continents in Europe. I'm currently in the Middle East. I've worked in Africa as well as in Asia. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you on your podcast today. And thank you again for having me. No, it's my pleasure. It's all mine. So how did you get started in the energy sector? I've always had the interest from school. I, I, I studied mechanical engineering in school, finished from the University of Lagos in 1998. And I had the privilege of joining a consultancy immediately after school. It was, um, it's a consultancy called Otho Anderson. It's a financial services consultancy. They are the parent company of the current company, Accenture, who is, who is into technology. But when I worked for that consultancy, I worked in the, in the oil and gas sector of that consultancy. And I was privileged to visit so many clients in the oil and gas industry. And it just opened me up to, it gave me the desire to want to work in the oil and gas sector. Okay. You mentioned before that you've worked in many different countries. What has been your most favorite country to work in? To work in? I would say South Korea. I I, I did a three and a half year stint in South Korea in a place called Goje, which is in the southern end of South Korea. at the southernmost tip of South Korea. Uh, and I was uh, working for Total at, the, at that time. We were building what they call a FPSO, which is a floating production, storage, and offloading facility. It is essentially a ship that has both the production facilities for a gas, an oil and gas field, as well as a tank, as a tank under it, which you use to store the product. I stayed in South Korea for three and a half years. I think it was very enlightening to go there and just see a completely different culture to what we are used to in Europe or in Africa where I'd worked previously. It was really, I really enjoyed my time there. The food was very good um, and their way of life was completely different for our, to, to what we were used to or what I was used to. So it was an opportunity for me to learn. Okay, what was the, the, the biggest thing that you learned when you were over there? I think the, the biggest thing is actually, for me, was the work, work culture. Okay, so two, two quick examples. I found out that they are, the children, for example, went to school for a very long day. They are, their day was particularly long. Uh, it's not uncommon to see secondary school kids go to school as early as nine and don't return till nine in the evening. So I asked a lot of them, why do you do this? And my understanding was that their universities were very competitive. The people wanted to work in particular organizations, and there was a limit on the number of people who who work in those kind of organizations, say a company like Samsung. So it was very, there was a lot of competition, very limited space to get into those corporate environment. And the people, they went to school for a very long time. So that was, that was one thing that was surprising there. Uh, the second thing that I really liked there was that I also noticed that although they have become very modern, there was still a lot of respect for their traditions, you know, in terms of, you know, 
their older people, how they took care of their older people, how they live together as a commune. You know, it's not uncommon to see in-laws live together. It was it was just completely new to me. Oh, and then obviously I have to say about the food. The food was really great. I have to say they make what they call, I mean, the Korean barbecue. They make probably the best chicken in the world. They made also very healthy food, bibimbap and things like that. So the food was very good. I love the way they lived in a commune and I love their discipline in terms of education. Excellent. Do you think that um, working abroad has helped your career? I will certainly say so. In fact, I preach working abroad a lot now to people based on what I've learned. I, it's, I always say to people, the best education that anybody will get in life is to work abroad to go and work in other places, to go to travel to other places and see what other people are doing. It just broadens your mind so much that it's unbelievable. Like I said, I started my career in Africa and then I moved to Europe. I worked briefly, I worked in the UK and then I worked briefly in Norway. And, you know, so we, I was used to how we did our, our work, which was, it was very professional. We were fairly regimented. So, uh, you know, you knew what you wanted to do in the morning and you followed that through. Uh, by three o'clock, four o'clock, we were ready to go home. It was fairly straightforward. And then you went to other places and you saw that, oh, they could afford to work till seven. They can take a break in the middle of the day and go out, you know, have a good lunch, come back to work. It, work was a little more flexible for them. It was not uncommon to see the, the companies take care of their uh, because the people were there in those jobs for a lifetime, you know, they take care of their students. I mean, for all of their families, schooling, housing, those kind of things. So it was, um, it was completely different. I, I, I recommend working abroad to everybody. It just, it just changes your mind. It's not that their system is necessarily better than ours. That's not what I'm saying. You know, their system is not necessarily better. But what it tells you is that it teaches you that there's more than one way to do a job, to do a task, or to leave. Okay, yes, yes, that is a, that's an important message. Thank you. Do you think that you picked up a diff- different skills in, in each country for the way that the engineer? The engineer, hmm, that's, that's a good point. I, I definitely picked up a different skill working in Norway. Yes, I, I picked a, definitely picked up something different working in Norway. I, I, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a quick example. Um, working in Norway, what 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 I saw was that they worked very hard. They came in, they did their work very quickly, and they went home on time. They went home at two thirty on Fridays. They will be out of the office by twelve o'clock. But they met all their targets. Their work life balance was much better than ours. Okay. So that's 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 what I took from Norway. In Korea, what I found out was that it was it was a very high patriarchy. Directions were very clear. If your boss said this is what he wanted you to do, that's what you do. It's there's no there's not too much room for argument. Now, so there's a place for that as well. I I took that from from Norway. Now I'm in the Middle East, and one of the things that I've learned from the Middle East is that the way they run their own contracts, their contracts are very tight. Their contracts are very tight. They are not, um, unlike when we worked in, 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 in Europe, where you and your contractor can have a difference of opinion and you will try and negotiate it down and things like that. In the Middle East, they run mainly lump sum contracts and their lump sum contracts are very tight. So once that contract is signed, there's very little room. Or variation on it. So there's something to blend at um, at each of those different locations, like you rightly like you rightly pointed out. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, that was excellent advice. Have you had any role models in your career? Why did you find them inspirational? Yes, I've had a role model. In fact, I always say two things. I always say about the place of a role model. Number one, you need a mentor when you're starting your career, for sure. But once you get your career to a point where you are a manager and you're looking at going to the director, directorship level, you need a sponsor. There's a difference between the mentor and the sponsor. You know, 
And that sponsor, I always say to people that you're fairly younger than us who are just coming up now, I say to them normally, if you're going to go to the next level, to a directorship level, it is by invitation. Nobody is likely, people are not likely to promote you to a directorship in a company because they think you're working hard. It's not, it's just not the way it works. Now, but let me go back to the issue of a, of a mentor or somebody that guided me. I was very privileged when I worked in MW Kellogg, London, which is now basically KBR UK. I had a gentleman called Aki Mahmoud. I just arrived in the UK. This must have been 2006. And I worked for Exxon in Nigeria and I just joined KBR in the UK. And by, by providence, he, he took a lot of interest in me, you know. And what I found was that for somebody who was coming from another country, another system into the UK system, I needed somebody to bed me in, you know, somebody who was willing to take the chance to give you your first task. Because actually, in many organizations, it happens that somebody joins an organization, but they don't challenge that person. They just allow them to try and find their own way. And that's why a lot of people get lost in big organizations. You come into an organization of 3,000, 4,000 people. Nobody is mentoring you. Nobody is showing you where to go if you have problems. Nobody is trusting you enough to give you a task where you can demonstrate your capability. You are likely going to get lost. So I was lucky to have this gentleman, and his name is Aki Mohammed Mahmoud, and he, he just took interest in me. Uh, I, like I said, I studied mechanical engineering, but the first task he gave me was to manage the subcontracts on the job that he was doing. And I, I said, I, t- I grabbed the opportunity with both hands. And I really did a good job on that, on that subcontracts management. And I, didn't, I never looked back. For seven years, I worked for him. And um, at some point, he was, uh, he was appointed a CEO of ABLE UK. And he invited me to come with him as his engineering manager in that organization. And that gave me my first full engineering manager role in the UK as well. So why am I saying all of this? I was lucky that he took interest in me. He gave me the opportunity. By giving me the opportunity, I was able to demonstrate what I was capable of doing. And then other opportunities opened up. If I had not met him, I could have just sat at my desk and be doing run of the mill things with the other 2,000, 300,000 people working in a big organization. You will never have had the opportunity to shine and if you don't have the opportunity, you may, I may not have had the opportunity to move my, my, my career to the next level. Yes. I cannot talk enough about having mentors. They are very important. We have to actively look for mentors and engage those mentors in positions where we're going to be able to demonstrate our ability. So what is your advice on how to choose a suitable mentor? I think, okay, it's a very good one. Yeah, so my advice on, I mean, on how to shoot, choose a suitable mentor is one, okay, that person must have a genuine interest in you. You know, there's a, there's, there are a lot of organizations where people are saying, oh, have a mentor, have a mentor, and they're just simply paying lip service to it. You understand? If mm-hmm. you are going to have a mentor, it must be somebody who is, one, who has genuine interest in you. Two, who is in the position to be able to look out for you by giving you challenging tasks and having those challenging tasks monitored? You understand? Mm-hmm. I worked for this, when I worked for the Aki, Aki was my engineering manager. I was a junior project engineer at the time. He gave me the task and on a weekly basis, I reported what I was doing on those tasks back to him. And as I did well on those tasks, he ensured that it was reflected in my in my ratings, and therefore I was given better tasks to do. I, I started, for example, on uh, working on a, say, $1 billion project, which was kept 2010, I remember at the time. From there, I was moved to Gorgon LNG, but that was based on the job that I did with him on the kept 2010. So a, a mentor must be genuinely interested. One, he must be in a position to give you the task, to monitor the task, and then to report upwards to other people, other stakeholders that you are delivering on your task so that people can begin to give you other challenges. Yes. Okay, that's excellent advice. You were saying before that to have a directorship, 
that no one's going to give you the opportunity to do that. You have to be invited. How do you get invited to do that? How would you go about getting invited to, to move your career to the next level? To, to the next level. Okay. It's, it's a tough one. I have to be honest with you, Michelle. This is a tough one because like you, like you, you and I know, in an, in an organization, a big organization, we have 10 directors, maybe 10. Yeah. A smaller one will have maybe five or something. So it's not, it's not an opportunity that, um, that is open to everybody. It's like being in a partnership, in a consultancy, you know? And I remember, like I said to you earlier, I, I, I started my career working in a consultancy. And there used to be a lot of people back in the day that got to the most senior level in manage, as a manager, and then they were supposed to be promoted into a partnership. And then they don't get part, promoted to be a partner in the first year, second year, third year. Then they get disillusioned. And why do they get disillusioned? Their thinking is this. We have worked very hard. Every year you have promoted me. You have said I've done well. Now the partnership is the next natural step, but you're not moving me there. And they don't understand why. The reason they have this thinking is because they think that to go into a partnership or into a directorship level is only about the work. It's only about the good technical work that you do. But often, more often than not, it's not just that. To go into that level, you need a bit of network. The owners of the business must be, be comfortable with you. They need to be sure that they can send you to represent them. Because remember, a director is an agent. It's about agency. They need to be able to send you to other places to represent them without fear, without the fear that you're going to represent them badly. Okay, so the only way to do it is that somebody who is already in that role is comfortable enough to say, look, I, I propose this person and uh, I propose this person to be able to come in. So I go back now to your question. Your question is, how do you then do this? So all I'm saying is that by the time you make a senior manager, let's say you're an engineer, let's say you're an engineer, you started as an associate, you've become a junior engineer, you've become a senior engineer, you've become a principal engineer, you've become a project engineering manager, a project manager, and now you're getting ready for the real big job, for the project director level type role. By the time you're a project engineering manager, you should already be nurturing some relationships upstairs you know, at a project director level, at least you should know one project director personally, you know, and how do you know that? Oh, you could just walk into the room to introduce yourself, introduce yourself and tell them what kind of project you're working on and just to discuss with them to say, look, if there are new opportunities coming from other projects in a year or two, when I finish this one, I would like to be, into, I mean, to be part of that. Now, what that does is that it, it, it gives you visibility. They understand? They know that you're there, okay? They know what your program is. You're working on a project, you're gonna be ready in another one year or two years. Now, by the time you have one director, two directors who know you, and when your name comes up at the big invitation level, at least even if they're not supporting you actively, they're not going to be opposing you. And this is the way to do it. You need to be able to know one or two people who are senior at that level, at least one person who can introduce you Another one or two who will not, who are not actively your sponsor, but who will ensure that you're not opposed when your name is being mentioned like that. I think that's the way to do it. If you're thinking that you're going to be in that level in another two, three years, at least you should start introducing yourself early to the guys who are up. It's called managing upwards. That's all it is. Okay. No, that's amazing advice, actually. Yes, I really, I really like that answer, actually. So, what is your most challenging thing about your current role and how do you handle it? The most, the most challenging thing about the role, it's always about the people. And so managing people is the most difficult thing that managers do. Managing budget, the budget is the budget you deal with it. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. But managing the people themselves and why? Because people are not constant. People may be this way today and that way tomorrow. There's, there's room for conflict. There's room for miscommunication. Some people are task-oriented. Some people are softer skill-oriented. So the managing the people will always be the issue. I, I'll give you a, a good example. In, in the role that I'm in now, I have 13 direct reports. 
who work with me. And, and many of these guys themselves have been in industry 25, 30 years. So there's really not much that you're going to say to them that they have not heard before. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And when people, particularly when you work in a technical field like ours, like in engineering, oil and gas engineering, mm -hmm. and things like this, most people are very familiar with the code. They are comfortable in their knowledge. They, are, they have done a lot of work. So there's not a lot of room for them to play. When they listen to you, they want to be sure that technically you are sound and, um, and they know what you, that you, you know what you're talking about uh, for you to be able to be able to, to manage them. So I think the, the, the biggest task that I do or the, my best way of managing it is buying credit with them. And how do I do that? Communication. Communication is the key. I hold weekly meetings with my team. This is number one. Okay. In addition to holding weekly meetings with my team, what I then insist is that when we're in a team meeting, because it's very quick, it's very obvious that more often than not, the people who can speak well tend to dominate the meeting without allowing the other people to speak. So as a rule in my own meeting, what I do is that I call everybody one by one. I have a one hour meeting, I assign five minutes to everybody, uh, pipe in what is happening in your area this week, you tell us. After five minutes, I go to the next person. So that way I'm sure that everybody, everybody speaks. This is number one. Now, because everybody has the opportunity to voice their own opinions and have the chance to speak, I find that they are, they are more open to me speaking at the end of the meeting to wrap up. Because basically it's a leadership by consensus. If you have somebody who's already 25 years in the role that they're doing, they have that kind of experience uh, they're not likely to be, you're not going to say to him, oh, I'm your manager, go and do this. No, they're not going to listen to you. So the only way to get those kind of people to do the work that you want them to do is to be sure that you have consensus with them. And to have consensus with them, you have to have a very good level of communication. With them. Okay, that's really, that's a really good advice. Communication is really key. Yeah. 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 It's, um, I mean, you know, and, and I now find that this is, for me, in fact, it's not only in the jobs that we do as technical people, it's in everything generally, political leadership, even in friendship, in relationships. The, the, I mean, you cannot underestimate how much you need to communicate. You, you need to communicate. You need to set the goals early. These are the goals that we want to achieve get people to buy into those goals. Now, if they don't buy into those goals, let's hear what they want to do. I mean, if you're a leader or you're a manager, you should use your authority very infrequently. As much as possible, you should try and get into a consensus position. It's the only way you're going to have to bring the rest of the team. No, that's a good, that's amazing advice, actually. So I was just wondering, leading on from that, if you were going to hire anybody, what would make an outstanding hire, in your opinion? Michelle, you, you're coming up with very good questions today. But fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I'm, I'm going to be a bit controversial here. I don't know whether you've heard that, that statement that somebody said that, that goes around in recruitment, that hire people for their, you know, for their, for their personality, for their, for their behavior, for personality rather than skill, because you can always teach skill, but you cannot always change personality. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. and, and so for me, the driver for me in recruiting anybody, the first thing is to understand whether what kind of personality that person is. Okay, I'll give you an example. I work in a project environment, okay? And in a project environment, now I'll put a caution statement there. This does not work everywhere. I'm using my own example because I work in a project environment, okay? And in a project environment, what are my key tasks? I want to be sure that I deliver a project on time, as basically scheduled, and within cost as much as possible without compromising the quality of it, okay? So if you're going to ever deliver a job on schedule, the first thing that you need to be able to do is to be sure that you have people who are able to take decisions. 
Do you understand? It's not somebody who is not sure. Somebody is, uh, oh, is this color white? No, I don't know. Uh, you, you understand? Somebody that is wishy-washy. You want somebody who is positive, who has, who can take a firm position on something. And why, is, why do I say this? See, it's better to make a bad decision and correct that decision than not make a decision at all. Yeah? It's better to make a bad decision and correct the decision because you will know it's a bad decision at some point and then correct it, then not make a decision. So when I recruit people, I want that person to come into an interview with us and to be engaging, okay? When you ask them a question, are they straight about it? Are they, can they give you good examples? Can they be firm in their position? Are they confident even when they think they are wrong, you know? Yeah. Can they be confident even when they think they are wrong? Because if they are wrong, you can set him, you can set him or her straight. You can share with other people who have experience and say, look, okay, this is what you said, but this is the way it actually is. But if somebody is a bit wishy-washy, what will happen is that when it comes to the time to take decisions, they will be in that, they will be wishy-washy like that. And what it will what will then happen is that it will make your contract position very bad. So for me, positivity, number one, okay, confidence, two, ability to take good decisions, you know, and then when you have those three, I think about the willingness to learn. Those are the four things I look for in an interview. Okay. No, that's excellent advice. Mm. Really good advice. So you had an amazing career to this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, you're still very young as well. You've achieved a lot in a very, very short period of time. Is there anything that you'd still want to achieve in your career? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, yes, there's still a lot done. I think I've always thought that in my career, I like to, I'm originally, I'm originally from Nigeria. I'm an African. I worked in Africa first, and then I moved around the world a lot. And one of the things I've always wanted to achieve in my career is to be able to bring young, other young people across. Do you understand? Um, To be to be able to say, okay, we 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 take a uh, a set of graduates, young graduates, and we walk their careers all across and let them learn just like we will learn, just what we have learned. And why do I say that? People afforded people like me an opportunity. People give us an opportunity. We need to be able to give as many other people opportunities as possible. So if there's anything I'd like to achieve in my career, I would love to set up an engineering firm of my own in the future. You know, bringing graduates, bringing graduates and help them to progress their careers. This is my biggest career wish. And I'm still hopeful that I'll be able to pull it off. I'm sure you would. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Have you ever encountered any career disasters and how have you handled them? Uh, Yes, I I won't say it's a disaster completely, but it was a huge challenge. In 2014, I don't know if you remember, just around uh, around 2012, yeah, Mm -hmm. the oil prices were very high. The amount of money we paid engineering people in London was very high. There were companies that were paying people £90 an hour. 70 pounds an hour. It was, it was very good times. And what and what had driven that at the time was that we were doing a lot of Australian projects. Gorgon was on, Browse, Pluto, all these big Australian projects were on. So pe- they paid people a lot of money. Then in 2014, the prices crashed. The prices crashed and the, um, and the industry went into complete turmoil, complete turmoil. I was working in Abel, uh, UK at the time as engineering manager. And Abel, which is a Norwegian company, closed that London office. They closed that London office. It was a particularly tough time for me because my wife just had a baby as well. So financially, it was, it was almost a disaster. My wife was out of work. I was out of work. We had a one-year-old baby. But, but this is why I always say to people, never ruin relationships when you leave an organization. It's always important to keep the relationships with whoever you have worked with. I remember the, the, the night I was giving the information that they were going to be closing our office because they could not sustain to, it was a very high, high over, overhead for them. And we were not generating enough money from the UK operations for these Norwegian 
company. So they closed the office. The first thing I did was I called my the former guys, my former guys in KBR in London. And I called that director of uh, projects. And I said to him, I said, well, I'm out of work because the office where I'm working here has been closed. Can he, can he, can he afford an opportunity for me in KBR in London? And he said to me, he said, look, I'll be honest with you, we don't have anything. But what I can do is I can bring you in on a temporary role for about three months. And then why, why that affords you the opportunity to look for other jobs? And I told him I will take it. He said, when can you start? I said, I'll start next Monday. And that was it. After 10 or 15 minutes talk, I had a job. Now, it's not that this guy and I so were actually friends. We were not friends or close or anything like that. But what had happened was that when I left the organization, I'd always, I left them in very good terms. I went to say thank you to them for the opportunity they gave me when I was leaving. And I kept in touch with them. So when I ran into trouble, I was able to call them and say, look, I ran into trouble here. Are you able to assist me? And thankfully, they were able to do that. So all I'm saying is that wherever you work, wherever any of us work, we might have our issues with them. We might, we may not like how we've been treated. We might, but as much as possible, try to live on good terms. Wherever is possible, try to live on good terms because you don't know when you will need these guys. I'll tell you a story that follows that though. I think it was late last year. They, I was working with another client and they were looking for a competent company to do the kind of work that we were doing on that project. The first people I called, I called this KBR people in London back. And I said to them, are you interested in this work? That's how you build networks. Do you understand? You build networks. It's not it's only that they are able to help you when, when the time is there. If you have an opportunity to also be of assistance to them, to help them develop their business and all of that, also give it a call. You know. So I called them back and said, look, we're doing this kind of contract. Are you interested in it? They said, oh, yes, we may be interested, but let's check. So... It's the relationships. You need to build the relationships. I go back to your question. Your question is, did I have a disaster? How did I navigate it out? The way to navigate it is to, to maintain good relationships and call on those relationships when you are in trouble. Okay, excellent, excellent advice. Thank okay. you. So what is your zone of genius? What are you most excellent at? My zone of genius. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so what's my son of genius? Well, I think I think my what people have commended me for the best most is the fact that I have a willingness to learn. You have to understand. For me, somebody wrote me a, a recommendation on my LinkedIn once, and I was really impressed with it. And the example he gave me that what and what he wrote was that he worked with me on a project and. Whenever we had a problem between a client and the contractor, no matter how heated it was, I was able to diffuse it. And how was I able to diffuse it? Because the first thing is, I come in and let's hear with an open heart from both sides. What's your position? What's your position? And then we'll find a middle ground. You understand? So I think that for me, if you ask that, what is the biggest thing I bring to my project is the ability to manage both sides. Not to, not to, I mean, basically my zone of genius, which is your question, is to look for win-win solutions. I don't, I, 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 I try to avoid working on one side against the other, whether you're the contractor or the client or the client versus the director. No, ultimately all of us are trying to achieve one goal, which is to deliver our project. We must look for win-win solutions rather than a win-lose or a lose-win solution. We must always look for a win-win. So how do you look for a win-win then? Okay, so let me give you a quick example of, of how you do a win-win. I mean, I've worked on projects. I mean, like I said, several projects. I've worked on, on projects where people come into a job and they are fully contractual. Do you understand? Let's assume that you are my client. I'm, I'm, I'm your contractor. Yeah? And yeah. You, you, you change your mind on, we've done a design for you. And you change your mind on the design. Yeah. If you change your mind on the design, it means I need to rework, do a rework of, of what I've given you before. Now, the question I have, I have to ask myself as a contractor is, OK, is this is this change that Michelle is asking for? Is it material enough? 
There's a concept in account, accounts, in banking, finance, and accounts, which they call materiality. So the question is, is it material enough for me to ask you for a change request, a change order? Do you understand? Because yeah. if it is not, if it's a if it's a hundred hours, a two hundred hours, something that I can manage within my stuff, I, it's best for me to to manage it without recourse to you. Yeah, I, I will tell you I'm doing this work, but I will take it on my own credit. Now, what that does is that in the future, later there will be instances where some credit is due to you, but you will keep back at the back of your mind. Yeah that I've already done some work for you before, yeah? I have built something into my credit and you will do that trade-off, yeah? But if the way I start the job is that you ask me for a slight change, which is 100 hours, let's assume that I'm charging people at 40, 40 pounds an hour. 100 hours is 4,000 hours, 4,000 pounds, okay? And I give you a change request for 4,000 pounds. The next time you have a change, which is due to you, you're not going to back down. You're going to ask for your own money. You understand? Now, and, and, and look at it this way. I'm not asking people not to be contractual, actually. That's not what I'm saying. But you see, focusing only on the contract has a way, and rather than relationships and managing people through, what it does is that, one, people start hiding information. Yeah? Number two, if people are not hiding information, they look for somebody to blame. You instigate a blame culture. Mm -hmm. And then number three, decisions will not be taken on time because you're waiting for the formal approval of a change. And what that does is that it messes up your schedule. So you need to assess things very clearly and say, look, this is the way I want to manage my work from the beginning. I want to manage it on a relationship because I have a long-term relationship with this contractor or with this client. Rather than going to that job and lock yourself into a contractor position from day one. I was on a job once. We just, we just gave the tender to a contractor. And within one week, my project manager issued that contractor a letter of default. Yeah? Now, a letter of default is the worst thing that you can give to a contractor. So if after one week or one month, you give the contractor a letter of default, you've already done your worst within, within the first month. You have no comeback. Do you understand? We must, not, we must learn not to escalate things too quickly. You need to build it, manage it until it becomes impossible before you get. Basically, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the statement of not killing a fly with a hammer, basically. Look for win-win situations, escalate gradually, and manage relationships. That's the summary of it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So how would you describe your typical working week? Typical working week. Okay. So in terms of the working week, so at the moment I'm working or in the Middle East. So I'm working Sundays to Thursdays at the moment. But my usual working week has always been five. I've always worked a five-day week. There are some in the industry who work six days, but I've always worked a five-day week. My typical work week starts on a Sunday here. And what I will do normally is that I will set up a target for the whole week <laughs> on Sunday. Um, I'm a bit task-oriented, okay? So I keep a very active to-do list. I've always kept a very active to-do list. So on a typical Sunday, when I come in on Sunday, there's three or four categories of things I want to see. Okay, do I have, I'm responsible in my job for approving any technical deviations on my project. Okay, so I want to see all my technical deviations, which technical deviations I'm likely to have in a week. I'm up responsible for approving a final approval for any engineering work, which is going to approve for construction before it goes to construction. Okay, what am I? AFC, we call these AFC drawings. So what are my EFCs coming in during the week? Then I prioritize all the meetings. I want to know all the meetings I'm having in the course of the week, yeah? And then I want to see all the management upwards that I need to do, i.e. meetings with my own managers and things like that that I need to do in the course of the week. I put that into a pot on Sunday. Then I assign it so that I can spread the work almost evenly over the week. And there's a tendency for most of us who do a task list to overload the front end of the week, you know, like uh, your first working day, Sundays or Mondays. But what you will also notice is that usually the meetings are at the beginning of the week as well. You know, bosses want to get 
or they are briefing at the beginning of the week. Decisions need to be taken at the beginning of the week. So what I tend to do is I tend to keep my meetings at the beginning of the week. They help me to set the agenda for the week. And then the things which are completely in my control, i.e. deviation management, approval of uh, AFC drawings, those kind of things, I push to Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays because I have better control over my time. I put the meetings and the, and the alignment sessions at the start of the week. That way, I get the direction at the beginning of the week, and then I can spread that over the course of, of that week. Okay, excellent. So who do you depend most in your working environment? Okay, uh, it's, it's surprising, but I will tell you that the person I depend on most uh, is my document controller. There's a, there's a role called the uh, DCC, Document Control, Document Control Manager. And why? Because most of what I do, like I said, is I, I look at deviations, I look at compliance, compliance to codes, I look at drawings being approved, for construction. So I do a lot of document management. I worked on a on an FPSO job where we processed over 40,000 documents and drawings to be able to manage that project. So you can imagine the scope of what of how much documentation you need to manage on a, on a job sometimes. On my current job, I think we're processing in excess of 10,000 documents, you know? And most documents that come to us, they don't submit it to us once or twice. They come in three, four times. So first they will submit a document to us, issued for comments, we will comment on it. Then they will issue it for approval, we will approve it, and then we will release it formally into the construction and to the commissioning teams. So to answer your question in short, the person I work with most is my document controller because document controller is coming to you. How do you want me to distribute this document? These documents are due for your approval. These documents are due for your review. These documents need to, letters need to go out. Contract letters need to be processed. There are so many activities like that that needs to be managed in the course of the week. Yes, I'm dealing with a lot of discipline engineers and people who are specialists, but the person I depend on most is my document controller. Okay. That's a really good answer, actually. The document controller is quite an important, important person within the engineering uh, departments and everything. Because it is, it, it is, it is. It's not a role that gets a lot of glamour. But if you have a bad one, if you don't have a good document controller, it could really mess up the world. Yes, I agree. I do agree with that. I think document controllers don't get enough credit for what they do as well. They don't. They don't at all. <laughs> no, they don't. So what keeps you motivated when things get tough? Uh, in terms of motivation, uh, you know, like I said, I, like I said to you earlier, Michelle, I, I'm a bit task oriented. So what I do, actually, one of the things, things will always be tough, actually, wherever we are, in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, whether things are comfortable now, you cannot predict what's going to happen in another two, three years. Things will get tough. Like I said, I'm a bit task oriented. So one of the things I do is I always, I typically write a 10 year plan for myself. I'm just finishing my current 10 year plan, which I wrote from 2014 to 2024. So, and essentially what I do is that, so when things get tough, I look at my overall plan. You know, if you have a 10 year plan, Within those 10 years, there might be a year that I stop for two years or one year that you think that you're not on target. If you limit stuff, your, your planning, the very short window, you will go up and down. Do you understand? You, mm-hmm. will, you find yourself to be very situational. Oh, today I'm happy, tomorrow I'm sad. But if you have a longer plan, if you have a longer plan and you work within a longer plan, you will find that overall, if you have that five-year plan or a 10-year plan, you're likely going to find out that you're actually on track. So it's like something that is, uh, that is, uh, that is spiking up and down a bit, but your general trend is that you're trending upwards. Do you understand? So whenever I feel a bit discouraged, what I do is I look at my plan. Am I on track? Am I generally trending upwards? You know, I'm also a person of faith. I'm, I'm a person of faith and um Whenever I get sad as well, I pray. So, so there, there, there are things like that 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 help you to to keep you on track. 
okay, um, where am I in my plan? Am I generally trending in the right direction? And then I look up to God and, and to my faith as well. And I think those are the things that keep me on, uh, on track when things are going tough. Okay. That's, in- that's really interesting because you were saying that your current 10-year plan is almost coming to an end. Yeah. Have you started writing a new 10-year plan for the next uh- 10 10- Yes, um, no, I've, I've, I've been making a few notes for it, but I will write it at the end of this year. I will write it, my, my next 10-year plan at the, at, the beginning, at the end of this year into the beginning of next year. And I'll be honest, your, 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 your plans, you've got, when you write this kind of plan, at least in my view, it's got to be something that is bigger than what you can achieve immediately. Do you understand? Yeah. I could be writing a plan now to say, okay, in the next 10 years, I want to gross, I want to do a business that allows me to do 10 million pounds. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that is a huge number. Do you understand? But that's why it's just the plan. Do you understand? If, you, if your plan is to do 10,000 pounds, do you understand? Then yeah. it's not a plan because you can achieve it just doing what you're doing now. Yeah? Mm-hmm. But if, say, in 10 years, I want to do a million pounds, for, for example, then what that does for you is that it allows you to think outside of the box because you, you look at, let me give you a quick example, Michelle. Say, so what is the average amount they pay us as engineers in the UK? We'll be lucky to get 40, 50,000 pounds, right? Mm-hmm. Average, if you're not a contractor, yeah? yeah? Okay, average working level person, 40, between 40 and 50. So if you set a 10, 1 million pound target over 10 years, on that salary, you're never going to meet it. You're never going to meet it. So then what that tells you is that you need to think outside the box immediately, okay? Then you ask yourself, okay, what do I then need to do to meet this plan if I want to do it? If I want to do that in a year, it means I need to be able to save 100,000 every year. What job can I do to be able to save 100,000 every year? If I wake up now and I go to Saudi Arabia and I get a contract role that pays me $600 a day, which is the going rate for average engineers in the Middle East. Do you understand? Yeah. I can put away, I can meet that target. I can meet that target with a lot of discipline. So, so, so the point I'm making is that the reason you write a plan, and when you write that plan, that plan needs to be bigger than what you're able to achieve straight away, is to be able, you then step back and say, how can I actually achieve this plan? Then think outside the box on how to achieve it. Do you understand? So, and I have to be honest with you, you don't always meet the plan. I don't want to put anybody on that undue pressure. You don't always meet the plan. But even if you set a target as big as that and you are 60% or 70% successful, you have done very, 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 very well. That's for me is why I write, I write a, a plan five years or 10 years. I, I only started it in uh, about 2012 and I wrote my first one for 2014 to 2024. And I'm going to write another one at the end of it. I'd ask people to take it on. It's, it's, it's worth it. Yeah. I never really thought about doing that to make your plan bigger than you think that you would, would achieve because you would always manage to achieve what you set out to do Absolutely. In, in different ways, even though if you think it's too huge and too, or too amb- uh, ambitious, you will always achieve what you try and set out to do. Absolutely. You know, I, I don't know which word the American president said. He said, if you think you can or you think you can't, you are right. It's, it's, if you set the goal, you will do it. But the important thing is to be able to set that goal and then give everything that, and even if you fail, you know you're giving everything that you want to do to get there. No, I really like that message. It's a really good message, actually. Okay, I'm going to ask you one final question. I'm going to end with one final question. If you could turn back time, what would you change? What would I change? Well, it's a, it's a good question. I'm, I'm one of those people. I, I, I said to someone recently, I said, there are not many things in life I regret. Not, not many things. I, I, I don't think. I will change much, Michelle. I don't think I'll change anything. I've been lucky. People have been kind to me. You know, they've given me opportunity. I've tried my best to work as hard as I can. And and I know I've been rewarded. I've also been adequately rewarded for it. 
Uh, there are a lot of people who, who say, oh, the company I work for are not being fair to me. My own approach in those cases is I make sure I develop my skill. If I cannot work with somebody, I move away from there. So I've been, I've been kind of lucky. People have given me an opportunity to show what I can do. And, and I've always been rewarded. I'm not going to change a lot. I don't think I'm going to change much. No. I've, been that, I've been that lucky, yeah. No, that's really amazing. That's really amazing to hear that. Yeah, so I've been lucky. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's been great speaking with you, actually. Um, uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, that you've given me to speak. Uh, it's really been a pleasure speaking with you. That's all the questions I have today. I would like to thank Adi for your time. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks for listening. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, I'd like to gently encourage you to leave a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show with another person. You can also follow me on LinkedIn or via my website, www.michellefraserconsultancy.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.